Dr. Steele. So she is uh, one of our faculty at the moment. And uh, uh, she's going to be talking to us today about some of her research uh, related to informing management and marine debris and exciting stuff like that. Thank you, Sean. So I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about my research. And we're going to cover a couple of different topics today, but I just wanted to give you an idea of some of the research interests that I have. Um, and a lot of these are related to science that informs policy. So, so management and policy strategies that are supported by sound science. So the two topics I'm going to cover today are looking at marine protected areas and are they a suitable management strategy for marine species? In this case, we're looking at an exploited reef fish, so reef fish that's part of a fisheries uh, fishery. Um, and we're also going to look at some of the more recent work that I've been doing uh, with students here uh, on marine debris and the impact of microplastics in uh, our local ecosystems. And this is a good example here uh, of our local e ecosystem that these coastal systems are subject to a variety of stressors uh, a lot of anthropogenic stress is going on, then these sort of meta-ecosystems are multiple interacting ecosystem units. So we'll talk a little bit today about how we as managers and policymakers can um, use science to effectively manage these systems. So the first uh, topic today is to tell you about uh, marine protected areas. I was looking at this, this fishery species, the schoolmaster snapper, Lugenus apodus. And this is a species that has an interesting life history, like many marine organisms. It has a dispersive larval phase, so these little fish are out in the plankton for a portion of their life history. Um, and then they settle, so they settle into a nursery habitat, in the case of snappers, uh, this is a mangrove habitat. And then they undergo this uh, later ontogenetic shift at a certain size, you think it's food motivated. Uh, to move on to coral reefs. And so that's some of the work we'll be looking at today. So I'll be addressing whether these habitats are important to conserve and whether uh, we um, can use marine protected areas to effectively manage this fishery species. So one of the uh, important foundations of fishery science is that it assumes density dependence. So direct density dependence is when we have uh, higher survivorship at lower population density. And as populations grow, resources become limiting, there's increased competition, and we get a decline in demographic rates like survivorship, growth, reproduction, as populations get more crowded. And that's why we have that MSY concept, sort of exploiting things uh, and thinning the population so the population density is lower, remaining fishes survive better, grow faster, etc. Uh, we may have density independence, so there's no relationship between demographic rates and population density, and we can have inverse density dependence uh, in some cases where as population sizes increase, then the survivorship or other demographic rates increases. And so one of the questions then about marine protected areas is what we tend to see in MPAs is that uh, marine organisms get crowded, the, the densities and the abundances go up, and uh, we might expect to see this direct density dependence then so that as populations get crowded, we get lower uh, reproduction, lower survivorship. So there may not necessarily be a suitable um, management tool for populations that don't, uh, don't do well under crowded conditions. And some of the important jobs, some of the important outputs of marine protected areas is adult spillover. In this case, we're looking at this fishery species, the snapper. We expect that as organisms become crowded, there might be density migration out of the marine protected area. There are also lots of big fish, happy fish, having uh, lots of babies. So they're exporting eggs and larvae into this adjacent fish area. Um, and so you can see these, these dense populations. Uh, the average size of fishes is larger in MPAs. And we expect uh, from MPAs this uh, adult and larval export. But if we have density dependence, so fish grow more slowly because there's competition, we don't get the really big fish that make a lot of reproductive output. Uh, we have crowding going on, so the population is not as abundant. Then we might get less of this larval and adult export. And so the question is, does crowding or resource limitation limit or reduce survival or decrease recruitment? So this, this process of uh, reproduction and recruiting back to the adult habitat. So some of the questions that I'm going to address, this is work that I did in the Bahamas. 
Um, is the relationship between schoolmaster density and habitat? Is schoolmaster recruit density, so the density of those juveniles, related to the adult density on reefs? Is there density dependence in schoolmaster survival? And that would have implications for our NPA management. Uh, and so we can look at if this is an effective management strategy for schoolmaster standards. Um, so we estimated schoolmaster density and the size structure of fishes, visually estimating the size of fishes and their density on reefs, on uh, uh, 50 by 10 meter band transects. These are on a whole natural reef, so a whole reef, thousands of meters squared in area, uh, between 0.1 and 1 hectare. Um, we're, we're, we're using these individual reefs as replicates. Um, and these are done on 12 sampling occasions, uh, about three months apart. Oh, something's happening. Identity Finder Enterprise. Please remind me in one hour. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay. Back on track, thank you. Um, so we're also interested in the habitat quality, so the health of coral reefs, uh, and the, the way that these snappers use this structure, they use these large coral structures as shelter, um, uh, shelter from predators primarily. Um, so we calculated the, the habitat quality as the volume of all coral structures that are greater than 50 centimeters in diameter, so all big coral structures um, on, these, on these same band transects. Um, and this is a suitable metric because this is the scale at which uh, these organisms are actually interacting with the physical structure of the reef. Uh, and we use a, a capture mark recapture study to estimate survival. This is a study that's done a lot with um, uh, lots of wildlife. Uh, we tagged over 1,800 schoolmasters, uh, and they're individually tagged, so we can follow the individual encounter history for every individual. And then we let them go into the environment and come back over the next 12 occasions and recapture them. Um, we don't recapture every fish every time, obviously, but we can construct these individual encounter histories to look at rates of survival and to look at rates of recapture. Um, and so we did this, uh, or I did this using program MARC, which separately calculates those rates of recapture and rates of survival. So some results. Uh, we found a strong relationship between the volume of coral, so these large coral structures, and the density of fishes on these reefs. It's a, very, um, it's a very tight relationship. We can predict basically how many snappers there are based on the um, amount of coral structure that there is. So that's great. That, that tells us something about the importance of this habitat, but it actually confounds density with habitat. So if we want to look at the effect of density, we have to separate that from habitat. So we're going to have to change one of those things. Are we going to change density or habitat? Which one do you think we changed? Right, exactly. So, so we, we had to uncouple this relationship between density and habitat structure. And so to do this, we did a transplant experiment. So we took these whole natural reefs of the five kilometer scale here. These are spread over about 25 kilometers. And transplanted fish, basically we paired sites uh, randomly that were similar in habitat quality. Um, randomly assigned whether they be donor sites or recipient sites or increased density or decreased density sites. And then we transplanted fish from one site to another in seawater tanks on the deck of a boat. So we catch fish, uh, transplant them to another site. And then this is data showing the pre-manipulation, post-manipulation period. So basically these are sites of increased density treatment, the red ones and the yellow ones are decreased density treatment. And so you can see in all cases we achieved the intention, you know, the intended um, change in density, so we decreased density at density treatment sites. But not only that, we also increase the range of densities that these schoolmasters are at, and that will give us increased power to detect an effective density, because we've extended that range of densities. Okay, so a result about the, the recruit and adult density. So we know they undergo this ontogenetic shift between mangrove habitats and they recruit to reefs where there's adult fishes. We found that reefs that have high adult density also have high recru recruit density or high juvenile density. And so uh, we see this both in the pre-manipulation year and the post-manipulation -manipula year. So we can say this is a robust, uh, probably causative effect 
that either adult schoolmasters are attracting juveniles to settle on their reefs to recruit to those reefs, or those juveniles are surviving better on the reefs where there's higher adult densities. We also found a positive effect of schoolmaster density on survival. So this is using those capture mark recapture histories, those individual histories. And we used a model selection, sorry, I used a model selection approach for this, um, testing a suite of Cormac Jolly SEMA models to calculate effects on survival. And I found that the model that has the most support in the data is the one where survival is dependent upon density. And in fact, survival is inversely density dependent. So at higher levels of schoolmaster density, we have an increased rate of survival. Um, and so this is perhaps not what we would have expected based on a lot of reef fish studies that are done on things like territorial damsel fishes where they're, you know, where things get crowded, they tend to have uh, direct density dependence. We actually found inverse density dependence. So a little bit of an unusual result. Um, and so we need to think about why that is. So just in summary, and I'll get back to that point in just a sec, the, the coral habitat, these large coral boulders, is really important to schoolmaster snappers. It's predictive of their density. Um, and this is a, a habitat that's declining in the Caribbean. So uh, it's important that we conserve these habitats, that we also conserve those nursery habitats, the, this, the mangrove habitats, and that we see this positive effect of, of density on both recruitment of juveniles into the system and survival of, of all fishes. And so this is something about the biology and the behavior of this fish. It's a group living fish, it's schools. Um, and so there are some uh, benefits then to living in groups, to, to being at high densities. And uh, I also tested for an effect on growth. There is an, an effect on growth, so that's not a detrimental effect um, uh, on their uh, growth patterns. Um, but we think, but I think that the, um, the reason that these fish are doing better at high densities is that they have this group living effect of, of better predator defense. So they're, they're put up with being at high densities because they survive much better being in a group. They basically have many eyes, uh, they have you know, alert to predators and, and various predator defense mechanisms uh, that mean that they survive much better in, in larger, at higher densities. And so some of the implications then for marine protected area management, uh, it's, it's obviously important that we conserve uh, life history state habitat that's important to various life history stages. We also need to recognize that for some species, especially these group dwelling fishes, that high densities actually enhance their recruitment and survival. So they do better when they're crowded. Um, and these enhanced densities in MPAs then should actually have a positive effect. So one of the jobs that we expect marine protected areas to do is to support adjacent fisheries. So we know that MPAs are really good for bio biodiversity conservation, but one of the things that we're trying to um, uh, implement MPA management for is to uh, support these adjacent fisheries. And so based on the fact that these fish actually reproduce better and survive better inside MPAs, the, the likelihood of larval export and um, an adult spillover is actually more likely for a group dwelling fish like this. And just to bring that back to a more sort of local situation, this is exactly the kind of thing that you could test uh, in our local marine protected areas. We have this great uh, California network of marine protected areas now. It's exactly the kind of thing that you could uh, use to test whether MPAs are a suitable, suitable management tool for other species that exhibit this inverse density dependence. So organisms like uh, black abalone and owl limpets that are sessile inverts, uh, are essentially sessile inverts, that require high densities for, uh, for effective um, reproduction and recruitment. So living at higher densities, they, uh, they attain larger sizes. That, in, that could potentially enhance their reproductive output um, and, and lead to faster population growth and recovery of these species that have been depleted through um, both overexploitation and disease. Okay, let me take a sip. So I'd like to move on to talk a little bit about some of the work that I'm doing locally with some of our undergraduate students here. Um, and this is looking at an emerging issue in Sandy Beach and, and other coastal environments, this issue of microplastics in our um, Sandy Beach ecosystems. 
So we know that Ventura County has a, a substantial part of our coastline is sandy beaches. Uh, we have about 41 miles of coastline and 93% of that is sandy beaches. And if you look across the whole Southern California Bight, we have about uh, 300 miles of coastline and about 80% of that is sandy beaches. So they're really important ecosystem, this iconic uh, California sandy beach. Looks like that on a good day in Ventura County, uh, a little bit more like this on a, maybe a bad day in uh, LA County. Um, but they have these really important socioeconomic benefits. They provide us with coastal protection. Uh, we use them a lot for recreation. Um, they are an important habitat for endangered species like snowy plovers. And they're also spawning grounds for cool things like uh, California grunion. And we have a lot of uses. We use these beaches a lot in many different ways. At least some of these uses are related to biological diversity. So things like viewing, uh, viewing birds, uh, um, uh, viewing other marine life, marine mammals, and fishing, surf fishing, that kind of thing. So, um, so many different uses, uh, many different activities going on on beaches. So one of the problems that we have, and this is not unique to California, but I'm, I'm going to focus a little bit on California, is this problem of marine debris. So this is uh, uh, washing up on our beaches uh, and comes along with various risks to wildlife, risks of entanglement. They can also ingest particles of plastic in some cases uh, that can lead to clogging of the GI tract. Um, and there's also a sort of secondary problem, which is that Plastics in the environment have the propensity to concentrate these persistent organic pollutants. So these plastics in the environment can have up to a million times higher concentration of um, things like uh, DDT, PCBs. Uh, so they, they concentrate and, and absorb these persistent organic pollutants. Other economic costs are fairly obvious that it's costly for municipalities or in terms of volunteer time to clean up these beaches. Uh, they can impact fisheries. They can impact property values, and it also impacts visitation. So people make choices about the beaches that they visit based on how much marine debris is there. And a study that was done um, in Orange County found that uh, basically the ch if, if they chose to clean up 100% uh, of the marine debris on their beaches, then uh, Orange County residents would save $148 million in terms of uh, not spending to go further, basically. So about $65 per o Orange County resident in terms of savings um, in instead of having to avoid this marine debris. So I'm going to talk about a couple of classes of marine debris. These are no classifications. I'm basically going to talk about marine debris as all the macro stuff, this, this, this mega debris, macro meso, I'm just going to call that marine debris. And then the micro debris is really this tiny stuff, less than five millimeters. Uh, so those are my two categories. And we find these in many of our local environments, uh, either floating in the open ocean, uh, it sinks down and lays on the, in, on in the benthic environments, um, and it washes onto our shores. So we find these in multiple environments. And so the goals of this study were to characterize marine debris, to look at where it is, to look at what kinds of debris that we're seeing, look at um, micro debris, where are we finding that, and what kinds of that are we finding and to test if we can predict how much microplastics there are based on how much macro debris there is. So basically a quick 15 minute walk on the beach, can that predict how much micro debris there is? Um, and then to determine if this micro debris is actually entering the sandy beach food webs. So this was done on 24 beaches in Santa Barbara, Ventura, Los Angeles County and our Channel Islands. And the, the, the Marine debris surveys were just done on a 50 meter swath of beach, two meters wide, uh, and basically counting all the anthropogenic debris in the, uh, in the, on the strand line and in the swash zone. So we just counted all the visible debris. Um, and we did this uh, as part of our Project Accesso um, undergraduate research program. So perhaps not surprisingly, much of what we found, much of what we categorized uh, as marine debris is plastic. So a lot of styrofoam, a lot of um, uh, single-use food-related plastics, uh, broken-down hard plastics, uh, a little bit of miscellaneous non-plastic, so cardboard, aluminum cans, those types of things, um, and particularly in the islands, but a lot of fishing-related debris. So a huge proportion of plastics, uh, and unfortunately, you know, it's a very durable material. It doesn't really break down. It just becomes smaller and smaller particles. 
Uh, and particularly, single-use food-related plastics seem to be a huge problem on our beaches. So maybe this is one of the things that we could target for you know, local ordinances, local uh, policy development in terms of reducing our use of single-use food-related plastics. So in terms of this distribution of these plastic and non-plastic debris across our beaches, I've arranged the beaches from north to south, and then these are the um, Channel Island beaches here. You can see, oh, and I should point out, this is a log scale here, so some beaches have orders of magnitude higher amounts of debris on them. You can see most of what we see here is plastics in the blue. Uh, it's fairly variable. There's some beaches that don't have any debris on them. Uh, some of the island beaches were debris-free. But we do see a sort of emerging pattern of a bit more debris, a bit more marine debris um, associated uh, with the Los Angeles area. So a little bit lower in Santa Barbara Ventura counties, fairly low on the island, but the majority of what we're seeing is plastic. Is, uh, is plastic. So in terms of identifying our microplastics, this is done by collecting 100 milliliters of sand from both the swash zone and the strand line on the beaches. The swash zone is where the wet sand is, the strand line is up at the top of the beach there. Um, and we collected sand from San Luis Obispo County down to Orange County and also from the Channel Islands too. And then we shake up that sand with hypersaline solution. So that the idea of that is to float out as many plastics as we can, only about half of manufactured plastic types actually float. So this is gonna be a conservative estimate of the amount of um, micro debris that we're gonna see. So we filter off a supernatant, and then we examine the filters and enumerate the microplastics by, by type, and we count them. Um, so we classify them by color and by type. Uh, again, to be conservative, you know, with these, you can see sand grains and these colored fibers and particles here. To be conservative, we only count things that are very obviously anthropogenic, so things that are um, you know, colored brightly and um, things like these polypropylene fibers. So this is a, a distribution of microplastics, again, from, uh, this is uh, in the north here, down to the south, and then the Channel Islands are on the end there. So you can see, again, it's a fairly variable pattern. Uh, most of what we're seeing is fibers, so these synthetic fibers, the kind of things that you'd find on uh, a fleece or uh, some sort of performance fabric, uh, things like polyester, poly polypropylene, and a little bit of particles. So it was kind of a surprising result to find this really high density, about 97% of things that we're finding are fibers. Um, and again, fairly variable across uh, the north-south. There's a little bit of a pattern where um, uh, we're to the south we're seeing a little bit more in terms of microplastics. And uh, one thing I'm looking forward to talking to Kiki and Linda about is there's actually a significant effect of littoral cell on this distribution. So this is the Santa Barbara cell, this is the Zuma cell, and this is the Santa Monica cell. So um, I think one of the next steps would be to look at the inputs into these systems and see um, how those are potentially moving around. So the question is then, are in fauna on the beaches, invertebrate in fauna, likely to ingest these microplastics? They're in the range of uh, sizes of things like zooplankton that they could certainly be consumed by organisms on the beach. We have both primary microplastics, which are raw, um, raw plastics like nurdles and microbeads that are designed to be very small. And then we have the secondary mi microplastics, which are the, the breakdown products of, of things larger fibers and fragments. And these are some uh, microplastic beads, so microbeads that have been extracted by uh, Dorothy um, from, from some of these personal care products. And it just so happens that these are almost exactly the same size and look almost exactly like runyon eggs. So you can imagine how something that's a filter feeder feeding on the beach might potentially be ingesting these microbeads. These are some of the other sort of secondary breakdown microplastics, um, some little beetles for scale in there. So it seemed obvious to us that the numerically dominant invertebrate critter on the beach, the, the sand crab, could well be ingesting these um, microplastics. It's a filter feeder, it, uh, it lives in the swash zone, uh, it's capturing zooplankton and various other bits of debris um, in these uh, feeding appendages here. Um, and indeed, when we looked to find whether or not these had ingested 
microplastics. We looked in the guts of sand crabs. We found both uh, fibers, so here's a couple of microfibers, and uh, in this case, this is a, a microfungi. So yes, in fact, there is a mechanism here for the introduction of these microplastics into the food chain um, of, of sandy beach ecosystems. So just to sort of extend this out, this is ongoing work. Uh, this is uh, uh, 78 sand crabs across 11 beaches. The great, uh, uh, sorry, so this is from uh, across five counties, 11 beaches, and 41% of these crabs had ingested microplastics. So just in a quick, uh, a, a quick scan across our coastline, we found a fairly high proportion that actually have microplastics present in their guts. Uh, and that average is about 1.2 uh, microplastic particles per crab across those 78 crabs. And as I say, this is ongoing work. So some of the problems then associated with plastics, and so plastics themselves uh, have additives to them, so plasticizers, phthalates, um, anti-static agents, flame retardants, those kind of things added to them. So those are present uh, in the plastics that are being ingested, but also this issue of persistent organic pollutants absorbing to these plastics, so they're potentially being carried into these organisms and, and then the potential for them leaching out um, is there. And as I mentioned, these are um, concentrating um, pollutants up to a million times higher than in the surrounding seawater. And so that has consequences for things like the bird community, willets, wimbrels, and sand, uh, sanderlings that are consuming sand crabs. It also has potential, is anybody a surf fisherman here? They like to go fishing? So it also has the potential for things like corbina and bar surf perch that are actually caught using the sand crab as bait. That this is a potential mechanism for these microplastics getting into the human food chain. So these are fishes that feed close to shore. So those near shore fishes are potentially ingesting these sand crabs and their um, associated plastic and, and chemical loads. So this is an emerging issue. It's clearly not restricted just to California. We've been working in the Cook Islands. Um, we're, we're seeing these, mi these plastics and microplastics accumulating in these far-flung places, these little remote islands. Uh, there's this pollutant concentration issue that they're floating around uh, in the Pelagia, collecting pollutants, and then washing up on beaches and bringing those pollutants into those uh, environments. And there have been recent studies that have shown the uh, prevalence of these microplastics in the human food chain, so in both fish and shellfish um, that are you know, being sold for human consumption. So in terms of how do we use this information, this is an emerging issue. I think you know, having keen-eyed scientists that are out observing the natural world and finding these problems is really important. So we have this ongoing research program to examine the biological impacts a little bit further to see how it affects uh, these ecological systems. It's really important that we identify the sources of these microplastics, find out how they're getting into our local environments. Um, and we can, it's really impossible to remediate this at the, at the beach end of things. We have to really look at source reduction so there's um, voluntary programs like the Clean Sweep program that aims to reduce uh, the loss of uh, raw plastics into the environment. Um, the microbeads ban that was just passed uh, a month or so ago uh, will actually go into effect in 2020, banning those microbead exfoliants in personal care products. Uh, given that so much of the microplastics on our Cal Southern California beaches uh, is single-use food-related packaging, that's something that we could look at uh, reducing our use of or looking for alternatives in. Um, and we know that local ordinances like uh, the carpentry plastic bag ban has really immediate measurable effects on, on local environments in terms of reducing these uh, plastics in the environment. Uh, we could introduce maybe recycling programs for fisheries, gear, monofilament, polypropylene lines. Um, and then this this is something that's going to take some technological development. So if anyone wants to think about developing some ideas about how do we reduce the source of um, these synthetic clo clothing fibers in our environment, uh, that's something that we could look at. This is a really uh, exciting topic for engaging citizens in science. So there's a lot of public interest in this issue. Uh, this is uh, an accessible issue. People, you know, People know beaches, they play in that swash zone with their kids. Uh, 
it's a it's a product that we uh, we all know we use our plastics every day, right? So it's a very um, engaging issue with the public. We have this really great, <coughs> excuse me, uh, simple portable protocol that doesn't use any scary chemicals that we can take out. We've taken this out um, to the Cook Islands. This is the Be Wet, Mon uh, the Be Wet uh, Big Watch Education Training Program um, on Ormond Beach. So here we're running the Sandy Beach Microplastics Protocol here with these students. They're really excited about it. Um, so there's multiple levels at which we can engage the public here. We're extending out our network to um, get samples from people from all over the world, which is great. Um, uh, and there's also, we're developing relationships with local schools, schools a little bit further afield in Monterey, and then the Cook Islands, uh, to be able to look at this, look at this problem on, on a more uh, larger global scale. And some future research directions. Uh, I'd like to look a little bit further about what determines the distribution of these microplastics. I'm assuming they're coming from rivers. Um, the fact that there's more fibers on the mainland beaches than, than on the island beaches is sort of indicative of that. But really to find the sources of, of where these inputs are coming into these littoral cells. Uh, to explore the effects of ingestion of microplastics and their associated pollutants on things like behavior of sand crabs. Um, and then to look at this microplastic ingestion at, at multiple trophic levels. So some of the next steps we're going to be looking at is looking at gut contents of planktivorous and piscivorous fishes to look at how these, uh, this problem is sort of being passed up the food chain. And then my final slide, sorry Don, <laughs> um, is to think really about how we can effectively craft science to provide managers with information, uh, maybe some information gaps about how MPAs operate. A lot of MPA models don't account for density, for direct density dependence, never mind density independence or inverse density dependence. Uh, we might understand more about the fundamental processes, the fundamental behaviors of organisms and how that might influence things like demographic rates. Um, and that matters because how effective things like MPA management is depends on the attributes of the species and fishery species that are involved. And then finally, that all of you pretty much are engaged in this, this scientific inquiry and observation. And it's really important that we have these sentinel people, these, these eyes, these many eyes, that are out there noticing these changes in our environment, whether it's an invasive species, an oil spill, microplastics, um, epizootic diseases like uh, the sea star wasting disease. So we can provide both baseline information for managers to measure impacts, and that we can provide both earlier and more effective management interventions um, to, to deal with these problems going forward. And I must thank many undergraduates that were involved in this work, um, both in the, the Bahamas work and uh, a lot of Accesso work and other students that were involved, undergrads from CSUCI. And I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you.